Welcome to Google Wiki. Welcome, my name is Bjorn Berendt, and this is the Google Weekly Podcast, which is part of the AskBG.net network of edtech services. Never stop learning. This is episode 18, Making Google Apps FERPA Compliant with CloudLock, aired February 27th, 2007. Welcome, everybody. I have a great interview lined up with uh, Gil Zimmerman, who is the CEO and co-founder of CloudLock. Uh, before we get to the interview, I want to talk about what's new in Google. First of all, Google Apps for Education New York, New Jersey Summit will be March 22nd and 23rd at Keene University. It'll be $200 for both days. Unfortunately, between scheduling conflicts, I won't be able to make it this year, but I'm looking forward to seeing people at other Google events. The visual image search in Google has been improved slightly, and this is actually related is related to the related searches. So if you do a Google image search, and at the very top you'll get the related images. If you scroll, actually the related searches, I'm sorry. If you scroll over those related searches, um, don't click, but if you just put your mouse over it, it'll pop up with three thumbnails from that search. So that is the improvement that they made into that. Uh, you can now collaborate in real time with the Google Docs app for Android. And this is a major improvement. Uh, in the past, with the mobile devices or with the tablets, you have not been able to get the collaboration. And that's the feature most people complained about when you move to a tablet device is you lose that collaboration. And that collaboration is what I think really drives Google, Google Apps and what makes it the best educational tool out there, in my opinion, uh, at least for the time being. So I'm really happy to see that the... Google Docs app for Android now has the ability to collaborate in real time. The last thing is webinars you won't want to miss. These are webinars specific to businesses with helping them get Google Plus and AdWords running. This is geared toward UK and European markets, but is available to pretty much any business owner. So this is a great resource. Now on to the interview. I have to say, Gil is a great person. And him and I hit it off right away off the – as soon as we picked up the phone with each other, we started talking. And I don't think we ever got – I never got to give him a formal introduction or we never got to start with the uh, – usually I try and chit-chat up a bit and then have a start. And that's where I'm going to start recording and bring it into the show. Uh, our conversation just hit it off right from the get-go. So – I did not get to do a formal interview, but this is Gil Zimmerman, CEO and co-founder of CloudLock. Yes, Gil. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> not bad. Thank you very much for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> Welcome to the Google Weekly Podcast. Thank you. My podcast is focused on teachers, and I started it just basically because Google, you know, they have updates every single week. And I needed to keep my teachers informed of that. But lately, I've been getting a lot of calls about uh, security and things like that. So when uh, actually David contacted me, yep, I, I thought it was a great opportunity. No, I really appreciate it. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. It's great to see people like yourselves uh, you know, spreading the knowledge. Um, it's fantastic. My son's school just went Google uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we ran into some security abuse issues firsthand right away uh, with some third graders having fun and uh, changing document names and um, you know deleting stuff. So, well, they can always right. go to they can always go to dad now to please fix this. <laughs> if they can for now until they become way better at it than me, then and then I'll be in trouble. Oh yes, I have two two girls, and actually on the beginning of the podcast, if you do get when you do get hopefully you do get to listen to it. I have my daughter okay. recorded the intro and the exit. Yeah, I heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great. This is your daughter. What grade uh, is she in? Uh, she will be entering kindergarten uh, in next year. Okay. And fantastic. I have another. Like, yeah, good. I have another one that is uh, just a little over one. So. Okay, so I have an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. So I'm happy to be here, and, uh, and hopefully I can shed some light, uh, at least from my perspective. We're not, um, you know, solely focused on education, but we also do um, help. When we have education customers, um, but I think a lot of the stuff that we do applies just generically across the board. Um, 
And I think what's also interesting, um, actually, you're you know, contributing to that is the fact that a lot of the students that are using Google and new collaborative technologies now, they are the workforce of the future. So you know, what they experience today and the practices and the, the way they work, that's the way businesses are going to be functioning you know, very shortly when uh, they move into the workplace. Yeah, I've always thought that uh, schools should model what businesses should look like. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, I've actually hit record already, so I don't know when we're going to officially start here. Uh, but yep. please, tell me about CloudLock. Sure. So CloudLock was founded by three co-founders, myself, Ron Zalkin, and Sachi Shapsa. My name is Gil Zimmerman. I'm the co-founder and CEO. And we started CloudLock really with the, uh, with the understanding that data is very, very critical to all types of organizations, big and small. And uh, whether you're a small business or a school or, um, or a teacher or a student or Bank of America with hundreds of thousands of users, you care about your data. You care about the privacy of your data. You care about the security of your data. You care about who has access to it and who you're sharing it out with. And also you care about what's being shared with you. Um, and we felt that the, uh, the data deluge or the explosion uh, was something that uh, was a force to be reckoned with. And we felt that we could provide a, um, a model that helped organizations deal with that challenge on Internet scale. Because really the, um, the uh, anchors of the on-premise hardware server world were really going away with the adoption of software as a service and cloud where access to data became ubiquitous. Everybody can do it from anywhere um, and really felt that you needed a new approach to embrace whether that's the business's requirement to have agility or the organization, uh, a school to be able to provide students with cutting edge technology so they can collaborate and learn how to, to work in the 21st century um, and beyond. But couple that without having to sacrifice really on the security controls and governance and compliance that any organization not just has to have but wants to have uh, because at the end of the day, you know, there, there is sensitive information that needs to be protected. Now, what got you started with uh, CloudLock? I mean, I was reading a bio of yours, and it looks like you've worked with many of large companies. <laughs> yeah. So I started off my career in the military intelligence uh, world. So obviously, and sometimes it is an oxymoron. <laughs> But, but we did get to do a lot of work with data and understand why it's critical um, and massive scale. And then moved into working with enterprises, uh, worked for companies like Sun Microsystems and EMC Corporation. And in any one of these large organizations, I would uh, inevitably be enamored by just the sheer volume of resources that they're throwing at this data problem, whether that's dollars or human capital, people, resources just resources that are thrown at addressing this challenge of where do we store all this information? How do we get access to this information? How do we put it to use so that, uh, that students and, and staff and faculty in universities or employees and companies can, can do their job? At the end of the day, that's, that's what they need to do. And working with these large enterprises, we saw that this, this was their, their third most important asset. So people and, and money to keep the operation running uh, whether that's you know in a school that's it's it's the the students and the teachers and the and the other staff and it's being able to to fund the school and the third piece is the data that they that they produce it's the the content that they use to teach the students in the business it's the intellectual property that they create or the the services that they're offering at the end of the day it's data pretty much everything else is replaceable if and if it's done correctly uh, that should be the case you could move to a completely different location buy new hardware buy new furniture buy a whole brand new building. But if you lose the people or you lose the ability to fund those people and you lose the data on, mm -hmm. on which they work or teach or learn, then you're, 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 out, you're out of commission. So, so really that's what got us thinking that this is something that hasn't been paid attention to. One of the analogies we like to use is, is that of a bank where organizations used to store their money under their mattresses in, in a safe inside the building. And they spent a, just a, a disproportionate amount of resources safeguarding that, that, that money. And very quickly they realized that they could do a better job by offloading that burden to somebody whose job it is and core competency it is to protect their money. And that actually opened up new venues for them to invest and they could put their money to work, if you will. And the same is happening now with, with data, where organizations used to host their own data because they felt they could do a, a, good, a good job of doing it. But that's not their core competency. If you're a school, you want to be in the business of teaching um, yeah. and crafting you know, young minds and giving them the tool sets they need to, for students to succeed in life and at work and in learning how to learn and not in keeping the lights on and formatting and patching uh, servers or desktops, et cetera. 
So what we're seeing now with the adoption of cloud technologies is really very similar to what we were seeing even before my time uh, when people started moving their money to banks. Where you're moving your, your Google, in the, in the case of Google Apps, is the bank. Mm -hmm. And you're moving your data to Google Apps so you don't have to take care of the headache. Google is a world-class data management uh, company. They're very good at it. Um, but that being said, just like in the banking world, it's still your responsibility to take care of your money. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't come to the bank at the end of the month and say, where's all my money if you've handed out credit cards and debit cards and, and, uh, and checking accounts uh, to all of your employees. And the same is true for schools. If you've given everybody access, you can't come to uh, the service provider with complaints about you know, people accessing inappropriate information. If you're not monitoring and controlling that to a logical degree, then, then you're, you're lapsing on your responsibility to, to govern your own data that just happens to sit in this bank mm -hmm. uh, of data. Now it's up to you what you do with it. And how do you make it accessible to the students? How do you make sure that they're, um, you know, and, and one of the things that we like to prove to customers is that there's this common misconception that, that cloud is a sacrifice in security. And in reality, what we're able to do is you can actually be more secure because if you layer on top of the right amount of uh, controls and governance, you can meet compliance requirements at a, at a fraction of the cost and time that it used to take you. You can apply policies around bullying and, and inappropriate content and misuse uh, and abuse, uh, where previously in the on-premise world that was very ineffective and cost prohibitive to be able to even think about doing that. Yeah, I'm, I've looked at, I took a webinar about your product and I've looked at some of the reports and things like that. I don't know how I could ever get that if I was using my physical servers, my physical file servers. Uh, just the information that you're providing, the security that you're putting out there works because it's in the cloud. Right. Yeah, so that's a very, very good point, which is, you know, I spent years in the, uh, in the enterprise security and storage world. Um, and the panacea there was this thing called the global namespace, mm -hmm. where really you would abstract away the uh, the confines of a specific of physical volume or device within which your data is stored, and treat all of the data as if it's one big uh, addressable bucket of information, and you'd you'd be able to get to it regardless of where it sits. Um, and that was very very difficult to achieve. In fact, impossible. I've never seen it actually done successfully on premise, regardless of any size organization, because. Any person could come in in the morning and right click on a folder in their new brand new laptop and share um, on the network um, and there's nothing installed there and there's nothing that, uh, that discovers it. But in the cloud, there's one logical address, which is your school's domain mm -hmm. or your company's domain. And you can do in the reports that you've seen and the, and the policies we can apply can apply to all of the users data all the time, um, not just to the data that they create and share out, but the data that's also being shared in. Okay. Well, I actually want to talk a little bit about what your product does and what you see when you do your product with um, CloudLock. Sure. So what CloudLock does is it's an extension to Google Apps uh, platform, um, and it's used. And it's installable in seconds. It's not really a software that you download or install. It's not something that end users install. It's, it's installed by the, um, by the IT organization, so it's completely transparent to the end users in most cases. And what it does is it goes off and discovers all of the data for all the users, and it does that on an ongoing basis. So it's continuously scanning and discovering all the data that exists in the Google Apps domain for that particular customer. And then what we do is we analyze that data, and we correlate that data to produce a very rich yet simple visual dashboard so that a single view, a customer can see all of the data that his or her organization is creating and how that data is being, what's it comprised of, and how it's being shared out. So who are the people that are using Google Apps, Docs, and Sites, and Google Plus? Um, how are they using it, and how are they sharing that information out, as well as what's being shared in? And what that does is it, it, lets, it lets the organization feel comfortable to embrace this collaboration technologies so that they can make it available to all of the end users and not force end users to go find alternative means and build their own solutions, which is often the case uh, in the education sector where teachers are forced to kind of figure it out on themselves themselves. And really what this enables the IT organization to do is say, we can provision and provide for our end users, which are our teachers and our students, something that's transparent for them. They don't have to learn a new tool. They use Google Docs and Sites the way they've always been using it. And behind the scenes, we have a tool to be able to monitor and control that so we can immediately identify 
uh, issues as they come up and then be able to take action against them. So we can see information exposure based on what's shared publicly, which used to be very difficult to do with on-premise technologies, what's shared outside, what's being shared in. It's not just the insider threats that organizations are concerned with, it's outsiders that like to prey um, on, on children or, or anybody actually with phishing attacks to be able to, to confuse people to, to, to look at documents they've shared and then enter in information that perhaps they shouldn't be entering in. And we're able to discover all of that data on an ongoing basis. And then we have a very sophisticated policy engine that's running behind the scenes that applies logic to basically interrogate that data. So if you, for example, want to look for all the files that contain uh, profanity, you can, you can set it up so that you're continuously monitoring documents uh, to look for that meet specific criteria or information that's being shared out and then take action against those. Yeah, I agree completely. And one of the problems that I see a lot is as an administrator right now, I can't tell if a student has shared something publicly. And that concerns me. Right. <laughs> so your product fulfills that right off the bat. And I have right. to tell so, you, the, how I first found out about your product, someone sent out an email asking about FERPA compliance. And so I just did a quick Google search saying Google Apps FERPA. And you are right on the first page, and you have a great summary. It was nice that it wasn't even really pushing your product. It was really informative about how what the compliance is that Google has. And I was just looking through that, and that really gave a nice overview. Uh, it talked about how it's basically your own data. And then it brought in your CloudLock, how you can really use CloudLock to f give a report so you can tell somebody, a government agency, a lawyer, that you are FERPA compliant. It is allowed you to really lock down things or really monitor things. Yep. The way we look at it, there's, there's three core elements. Um, mm -hmm. In the business world, it's, it's the business, the IT, and the end user that make up cloud data security. In the education world, it's, it's, the, um, it's the, the school administrators or uh, the faculty and, and teachers the, the, who are running the school, the IT, they're running the operations, and the end users are the students. And all three of them really need to be a part of the mix to be able to, to really address the cloud data security. So one of the things we do, for example, is not just give visibility to IT to be able to report back to the, to the business or to the, to the administration to be able to say we're in compliance. It's also including, including the, the end users and the students themselves to notify them when they're in breach of compliance or acceptable use policies. And we can do that with email notifications to tell them this is something that's been flagged. And we can also do that by creating collections within their native Google Docs interface. They don't really know that CloudLock has done this as far as they're concerned, it's completely transparent. And then we, we tag basically all of those documents and, and content that, that are violating a policy um, so that the end user can, can take a look and, and be an active participant in cleaning up their act or, uh, or making sure that the organization is, com is in compliance. And that's how we help scale. It's, it's one thing to be able to report. It's a whole other thing to be able to enforce. Um, and including the end users is, is the only way to really scale that and, 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 and if you give people the option, uh, most students and, and end users and the business alike, they're, they're not criminals and they're not out to abuse um, and they're not looking to, uh, to do something they should. A lot of it is, is erroneous and a lot of it is external threats um, that, that they just, you know, that they, they messed up um, and it's very easy for them to fix. Mm -hmm. And if, since they're the ones that are creating the documents and, and just knowing that there's an oversight prevents a lot of abuse to begin with. Well, I'm thinking about me. I'm a power user, and I've created so many documents, and they're all at different sharing levels. I'm looking to enable this in my school just so I can even make sure I'm in compliance because uh, there might have been one time where I've had to share you know, link only with somebody, and maybe that document I should unshare, and I don't even know it's that out there. Uh, so yeah. great reporting. It also brings into there's a lot of chatter around archiving. I know in Vermont everybody's looking for the new archiving tool and – there's Postini for email, but there was nothing really out there for docs that Google provides. Right. And I know you're, you're shoot, pushing the uh, security end of it, which you guys do great, but you also have another product out there too that fulfills the archiving. Yes. So uh, we feel part of, part of the protecting the data is making sure that it stays around so that it doesn't get destroyed or manipulated in certain cases. And it's, it's definitely a requirement that's come up by a lot of organizations around compliance to be able to prove and have an auditable uh, trail 
that they have practices and procedures in place to prevent the manipulation of data after a certain point in time and prevent the destruction of data. So our CloudLock Vault solution basically puts that on autopilot and makes it completely, again, transparent to the end user so that the organization can put in place a policy to say this is information that we want to hold on to um, and basically based on a retention schedule, keep information around it's, and move it to an organization-owned account so that, and then there's different varying degrees of, of collaboration restrictions that you want to have. You can take it away completely, you can leave it so that the original owner can still view the document, or you can leave them as an editor, but you can take away their right to destroy the document. So even if they did go in and edit it, you could always go back with revision histories to go see you know, what the original contents looked like. So it's a very flexible way to, to hold on to information. We see it as something that's, that's less uh, overlapping with Postini and really more an extension. Even if Postini was to provide retention around documents, it's really more meant for reactive discovery purposes. And we think that, uh, that our solution is a lot more flexible that allows, allows organizations to implement full-blown workflows. Uh, and not just a, um, a reactive solution, but really be, be, be more proactive around moving information around the organization. Well, I've been very sold on your product uh, from the webinar I've done. Uh, one of the other things I wanted you to hit upon, this is coming up, and a lot of schools are really looking forward to the Google Plus integration when Google allows that to come to K-12. Yep. But there's also a big security concern about that. I have not seen yep. another company out there that's been – thinking about the Google Plus. You want yeah. to? Yeah, I'll definitely have to touch on that. So I think, I think you know, just like we were talking about earlier, I don't know if we were recording at the time, but I completely agree with your philosophy that schools should be educating students based on what the workplace should look like. Um, and, the, and the future should look like a much, more, a much smoother social fabric and interaction, even in the workplace. So the fragmented ping pong days of email, I think, are, are limited. It won't necessarily go away completely, but I think a lot more can get done through short bursts of conversations and hangouts and, and other more social networking-like capabilities than through email alone. Mm -hmm. So I expect that that will be a, a force to be reckoned with in the workplace. Um, you know, just look at the adoption of things like Facebook and Google Plus is, is growing as well. It's still in its infancy when it comes to organizational adoption and the APIs aren't there yet, but from our perspective, it is something that every single one of our customers that we're talking to in every sector is looking to enable their users to, to leverage. And one of the things we like to talk about is, is rogue collaboration. So I mentioned earlier, you know, if most, most end users are not looking to break the rules. Uh, they're just looking to, to collaborate. They're looking mm -hmm. to get their, their task done, whether that's writing a document, working, submitting a paper or a project, or if it's work-related. And if IT gives them, the organization gives them the tools, the best tools to do that, they will gladly use them. And it's a much better solution for everybody. However, if, if IT is holding back and not providing those solutions, users will go off and find their, their own tools to, to supplement the, you know, and fulfill their needs to get the task done. Um, and that's where it starts to, we call that rogue collaboration, mm -hmm. where people use their personal Gmail accounts or personal, it, it, the last thing you want is students using Facebook to talk to each other with, in a completely uncontrolled environment. And that's also the case for, for, for businesses in general. So we believe that if organizations can securely embrace social collaboration, it's a win-win for everybody. And the ability to do that, it's not just about the internal governance, it's also external uh, governance because it, this is again. This is a. It's a huge paradigm shift between everything would go through email to get to the outside world to now I can share documents on an ongoing basis, just like you mentioned. This is not a transaction. It's not I shared it with you and we're done. This is I shared it with you it's and you can come back. Right. It's a collaboration. You can come back whenever you want. And people very easily grant permissions. Very rarely do they go back and revoke permissions mm -hmm. unless you help them, you know, like we do with our end user enablement function. Um, as we think. The, the social fabric of you know, Google Plus uh, is no different, and we're, you know, we use it extensively here. We're semi-using it now with, uh, with Google Voice and, and video. Yep. Uh, but the Hangouts, it's, 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 it's just completely different in terms of, I think, you know, it's one of the things I look at for, you know, for my children, which is the skill set is evolving. Whereas before, when I was you know, uh, coming into the workplace, I would spend a lot of my time just getting the logistics around how do I get information to the right people and connect with them and wait for them to review it and come back and connect with multiple people, where now 
that has just gone away. I can connect with people visually, verbally, and uh, in writing and work on the same document in real time across the world with dozens of people. It, it's phenomenal, and it's something that, uh, that should be embraced wholeheartedly. We're, yeah, we're doing that now with the show notes. I mean, you, I'm assuming you have that up on your screen. Or yeah. You did. Yeah. Uh, I do. Adding it. And yeah. I got it up. I'm, you're looking at making sure I'm right on track. Yep. And I plugged Google Plus because you actually have a placeholder in there. And that's just like it, it catches your eye if you're an educator. Like, oh, my goodness, I can actually – it may not be fully implemented yet. We're still waiting on Google. But I know it's coming, and I know it's yep. on your roadmap. So I'm excited yep. to, about that. Yeah, so it's, it's actually already in uh, – it's in the product. You can – there's a little link to, uh, to turn on our beta for Google Plus, and it's limited to the extent that we can leverage Google's APIs. But one of the things we you can do today is you can see um, all the profiles of Google Plus users publicly that are associating themselves with your organization. Um, and, and that's also something to take a look at. Definitely. Now, the other thing that really caught me is your pricing. Normally, I'm looking at this, and I'm used to the Google pricing or actually any pricing of these where it says, well, let's look at the how many users you have. And go straight off of that. I mean, I was looking at the educational cost of your product, and it's seven dollars for the security and eleven dollars for security and vault. But you actually took that a step further and said that's only for faculty and staff. So you left the students out it, which just took the price down to I can bring this to my principal and probably get this going very quickly uh, without as many hoops. Whereas if I had to add. You know, well, I'm a very small school. I only have 100 students and yep. 20 teachers, but there, that makes a big price difference. Yeah. What would, what was the choice behind that? So I, I think you know, part of it is we're not looking to gouge customers. We're a subscription business. I think that's one of the benefits. It's also there's this whole another world of transformation that's happening, not just from uh, it's, it's hidden to, to most users. It's not just from a the actual collaboration application that, that end users get to see. It's the business models behind them. So software as a service coupled with that is this whole notion of subscriptions. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, fundamental to subscription business is earning customers' business uh, and making it affordable for them to subscribe. So it's not a shelf where you know I sell you a product and then good luck with it and come, I'll come back in three years to try to sell you the new version. I need to earn your business every day. And, and the only way to do that is by sharing the cost savings and by continuously innovating and providing more and more value. So our, our decision criteria there was to, you know, on the one hand, we don't want to lose money in the education market because we know Google provides a very steep discount uh, to <laughs> educational institutions. But on the other hand, there's really no need for us to, to seek the same level of profit on the educational organization as we do. Um, it's, we see it as a strategic investment as well. Well, I've always looked at the schools as being kind of the hub. We have every business owner in, well, in the area that has a child has one in school. I right. work at a private Catholic school, and a lot of the big business owners are send their kids here, and they see Google Apps right away, and they're going to see CloudLock. So I've seen this you know, kind of feathering out to the businesses starting at the school, and I think that's exactly how it should be. The school should be the center. The school should be the leader. And it's also one of the reasons why I hate the comment, well, the business isn't doing it, so the school shouldn't. No, it's the opposite. The school's right. doing it, so the business should do it. So I'm happy to see that your business has had a philosophy that follows that. And Yeah, absolutely. It's something that everybody can resonate with. If you, I mean, if you have children, you understand why it's important to protect them and um, and to keep them safe and to teach them to be you know, a good cyber citizens. Um, Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. So good cyber citizens. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's part of it as well. It, it, it's not, uh, I think the, especially in their formative years, uh, the experience you want them to have is not, you know, the internet is purely a, um, you know, just a, a disgusting hell hole <laughs> for, for lack of a better, <laughs> lack of a better term. The, the, it really can be used to, for, for better purposes, and it should be. Definitely. My yeah. daughter, my young daughter, my five, almost five-year-old daughter has Friday nights. She gets to play on the computer uh, yeah. before bed, and that's usually just PBS Kids. So, yeah. uh, it, Amazing resource. She also knows how to use my phone better than I do. 
Yeah, that's the mine are like that too. So what is the best way to, I guess, contact a salesperson? I don't think they always need to go to straight to the CEO unless you want to give out some contact information. No, yeah, I'm happy to talk to any customer. I, uh, our philosophy is we should be so lucky that the customer is willing to, uh, to spend the time to talk to us. So happy to talk to anybody. My email is gill at, at cloudlock.com, which is gill with one L. But the best way to reach and learn more about us is to go to cloudlock.com. Uh, or send an email to sales at cloudlock.com. Yep, and I will vouch for one of your webinars. I took one of them. They were great, great, informative. And the other thing is you guys, even your salesperson that took some of the suggestions that I was mentioning and just sent it right up the chain, and it really gave me a good feeling that you were taking my input too. And Absolutely. So thank you very much for that. And, and let, is there anything else? No, thank you for uh, for everything you're doing and keep it up. And uh, we look forward to, to staying in touch and, and keep the feedback coming. And uh, we're, we're happy to, to, work, to work with you. Okay, well, thank you very much and have a good day. <laughs> While I can't thank Gil enough for the interview, I think we hit it off great. And I'm looking forward to using CloudLock with my schools. And that brings me to the app exploration part of the podcast. I'm skipping the Google Apps Marketplace app for this week, mostly because CloudLock is a Google Apps Marketplace app. If you do decide to purchase it, please uh, let me know. And also let them know that you heard about it from the Google Weekly Podcast. That is great information for both of us. And on to the app for the Chrome Store this week. And I chose something called Hangout Canopy. Uh, This is a little tiny extension that will help you share and find public Google Hangouts. And I enjoy Hangouts. I had one at the Listener Hangout. I think it was a great success. I've met some other people just by seeing what other Hangouts are out there. And I'm sitting here looking at it, and I have it enabled on my screen, and I see I have 17 available public Hangouts that I can uh, view. So I'm looking forward to playing with that app a lot more. And on to the Android app of the week. And I've actually heard of other ones from this company, and this is a newer one. And this is Pocket Cloud Explorer. And what this little app will do is it'll actually let you explore your personal computer files from your Android device. Great little app. It's gotten four stars. It's not free, but it does cost only 99 cents. And it seems to have a lot of really good user reviews. So that's Pocket Cloud Explorer. Well, I think that's going to finish up the show today. So thank you very much for listening to the Google Weekly Podcast with your host, Bjorn Barrett. You can follow the podcast and contribute by going to www.google-weekly.net. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. I encourage you to get the conversation going around the show by using the posting comments on the blog or by using the hashtag GWPodcast within your social network. Again, thank you for listening and never stop learning. This is Torrance, and thank you for listening.